No, so I keep this very informal. I thought I was going to talk to mostly sort of physics -y people, so I'll tell you the kinds of problems we run into. Uh, there will be some biology in terms of experiments, but I can go into lots of details on anything that you want. Um, so, interrupt. I don't need to get through the talk. Um, I can stop anywhere. So, we work primarily on two systems. One is looking at early human development. For this, we've been using both human embryonic stem cells and human fetal tissue. Uh, so here is an embryo to start with. It's one cell fertilized and eventually it becomes this hollow ball with these cells inside there. These blue cells are going to become all of you. Um, and if you take these blue cells out and keep them in a dish, they're embryonic stem cells. They can give rise to all the cell types in your body. And so initially you have this embryonic stem cell. This thing should have been in blue if I had the right crayon. And then it makes a series of fate decisions, gives rise to all the cell types in your body. Uh, we've primarily been interested in the nervous system development, so I'm biased, but there are other things that come out too clearly. Um, and one of the questions we want to ask is, can we make these cells do what we want them to? Uh, build tissue like we want them to? Can we control them? Uh, and I'll come to more of that. Um, and the kinds of things we have been able to do, and this is all published work, we can take these cells and make cell types in your brain. Uh, they come, so I'm just gonna rush through the biology results somewhat, just to give you a feel for the kinds of experiments we can do, and then go through some of the really difficult challenges we are facing in terms of statistical inference and where we need help. Um, so we can take these stem cells now, we can make them into neurons in the brain, we can make them into different layered neurons, uh, and we can control their differentiation, make them into both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Uh, we can take these cells and following beautiful work from uh, Sasai, make eyes in a dish, so these stem cells form proper eyes. Some of them fail, as you can see, but this is a perfect eye. The green stuff is a retinal pigment, which is on the outside. The stuff inside, the purple is the retina. So just from a ball of stem cells, if you just nudge it the right way, it automatically forms an eye for you in a dish, and we can start studying it. The big problem in both the previous slide and this slide is that only a small fraction work. We still don't know how to get perfect reproducibility and this is important both to actually understand the system, but if you really want to use this for any medical purposes, if half the things break all by themselves, then any molecular perturbations are useless because you don't know if you broke it or was gonna break anyway. So these systems are still not really useful for medicinal purposes, but we're sort of trying to struggle with them. The, sorry. Yeah, so you have to do the right thing at the right time and so we can sort of get there. Um, the other system we work on is uh, C. elegans, and I'm gonna, for the, I've never given this talk before, I'm gonna try to tie these two stories together. The honest truth is that just smart people showed up in my lab and wanted to do these two things, but I've never talked about them in the same place at the same time, but I'll try. Uh, but I think the inference challenges are the same. Uh, so here is a worm, that's the little worm there, magnified, that's its nervous system, so that's the other system we look at. I'll play the movie of its moving. So this white patch is food and all these animals try to go towards food because they're hungry presumably and some take longer than others. Uh, this is just a Z stack of the nerve ring where most of the neurons reside. Okay, so that nervous system is controlling behavior. And roughly speaking, this animal quite unlike us has only 300 neurons, 100 sensory neurons, which sense the environment, 100 interneurons, which presumably process the information, 100 motor neurons that control the muscles and make it move, right? And in this case too, we want to ask, can we turn this animal into a video game somehow and make it do precisely what we want it to do? So both in the case of cells and in the case of the animals, we just want to turn both of them into video games. Um, that's it. So we've already done some of this, and this is again published work. We can control the neural activity of this animal and make it think it's food, there is food in the environment. Since we are doing it all optically, we can make it think there is food in different directions. So in this particular case, I'm just gonna show you the experiment. This animal thinks that there is food here. And since I'm doing it all with optics, controlling the rules of sort of the activity patterns of the key neurons, I can suddenly make it think there is food the opposite direction. 
and essentially make it chase the laser pointer if you like if it were a cat, right? So you can make it do things like this. So you can actually start taking control and you'll see it starts searching, you feel kind of sorry for it, and then it'll turn. Uh, and this again is all published, so I won't go into details, but it can sort of, we can do this. So we're beginning to be able to actually take control of this thing with just 300 nodes and start making it do stuff. Okay. And see here, the system itself has no mechanical inertia, but it'll keep running for a while in the wrong direction and then go, oh shit, and turn around. So clearly, you can start asking questions about expectation and inertia. This is all optogenetic control, and I'm not, yeah. So I'll come to more of it at the end. When you say few neurons? It's about three neurons. Three? three neurons with the right dynamics. So, So the point is this, sort of the broader question, if we really want to start taking control of these horrible biological systems, you have some input. This is box is the animal or cell, and that's the inside. And it makes some decisions. In the case of stem cells, it decides to become parts of the brain. In the case of the animal, it decides to go forward or backward or left or right. What we want to do is forget about the inputs, just knock this out directly control the insides of the animal or cell and make it do what we want it to. So as I said, turn it into a game and control it precisely. Uh, if we can do this, it'll be fun. Um, so I don't know why the slide is not showing up properly, but on my, let's see, yeah, no, somehow it's not showing properly, that's fine. Think of the blue box here, which is on my screen, okay. Each of these points are some node in some miserable network, either molecules reacting with each other or neurons connected to each other. And think of all these points connected by a whole bunch of gray lines, depending on how they interact. So it's some horrendous mess, which is presumably why most of us didn't get into biology to start with. So it's like horrible crap here. You want to, huh? No, at least so, so, the way we were taught biology growing up. Uh, and so somehow you want to sort of take this mess and try without, I mean, so the question is, what buttons do we push in here in this mess to get something out the other end? In the case of C. elegans, there are about 300 dots in there, or let's say 100 dots if you're just trying to control the interneurons. In the case of stem cells, there are about 2,000 dots there if you just think of transcription factors. And so somehow you have to know which buttons to push with what dynamics to get what you want at the other end. And ideally, and I don't know how to define this yet, you want to find the smallest number of buttons. So I don't know how to make this question precise. You can make me walk by just controlling my motor neurons and pushing me along, or you can actually want me to make walk, which is sort of different. So you somehow want to ask, what is the smallest number of buttons you can push to be able to make the circuit do what you want it to do? And the few examples I show, Something like that. I don't even know what that means, but I don't want to use, yeah, so I don't know what that means, but somehow we have to make this question precise. And since this is sort of a informal talk to friends, I thought I would just be vague. I don't know what that means, but somehow we want to push the smallest number of buttons. The system knows how to make it go. Exactly, exactly. The system is doing it fine. The inputs are red. The inputs are red, processed. Converted to like kind of buttons and. Exactly. So the system is doing it as such. What we thought we would define the problem as, as get rid of the inputs completely, just push buttons directly, which what I showed you with C. elegans, make it do what I wanted to do. So then the question is, how do I find those buttons? And if I could find those buttons efficiently somehow, it's, I don't know if it's an important question or not, but that's what is driving me currently. Uh, so that's sort of the goal. Standard question is, don't know, don't know. So the only thing I know is if I can do the experiment, that's why I showed you the movie right at the beginning. Uh, three buttons, we can do this, few buttons here and there, there's 50 years worth of literature in developmental biology where a few buttons sort of move things here and there. So it's more, I'll come to sort of my beliefs, sort of there is a slide titled religious beliefs, but it's sort of motivated by beautiful biology over the last, right? it's always been a few things. In that sense, it's very different from physics, right? It's not some collective phenomena that's driving the circuit. There's always a few important places where you push and things happen. So it's very different from sort of the physics worldview, I guess. 
So the key question is which buttons to push, what dynamics to impose and know. And this is the open question we need help with solving. And I'm just going to tell you some progress we've made here and there. But there is amazing amounts of data coming out and all this sort of stuff. And then the question is, from all this data, can you tell me what precise experiment to do so that my stem cells form an eye precisely 100% of the time? That would be useful, right? And currently, I would say we don't know what we're doing. We have no clue how to do it. It's sort of experimental trial and error. And there is no framework to figure out how to do it. So I'll just sort of, yeah. So my question is then going to be how do you figure it out? I can tell you about specifics. It's just being locally smart, but not seeing the big picture in any sense if such a thing exists. Even algorithmically, how do you find it is a question, right? That would be nice, right? So locally, you can start thinking. Of, I'll tell you some ways we're trying. I'll get to the answer for this one in some sense. Are you going to address the especially things like decision-making? I can tell you that in some cases, we can get you 100% one way or the other. If we know what we're doing, we can get 100% of the cells to go one way or the other. And I can tell you lots about stochasticity. It seems like people don't know enough about where the cell, this is sort of experts maybe, but you don't know where it commits to a fate and the interpretation of the signal changes. But if you hit it right and you know what you're doing, 100%, right? Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying, I'm just asking a very mercenary question without asking more important, profound questions. I just want to say, can I take control of it at all? So one question you asked was, how do you know if there are a few nodes? I don't know, but if I can do it, that's the answer. So, and if there are too many nodes, there are two issues with having too many nodes that you have to control, and I can give the answer in two ways. One. Experimentally, I do not know how to manipulate hundreds of nodes with the right dynamics anyway. So I would never be able to prove that there are lots of nodes that are important for control. I'll just prove by failure. In terms of disease or whatever is experimentally feasible, if there are more than a few nodes, I might as well just go home and give up. So there is hope only if there are a few nodes. Otherwise, the problem, I think, is hopeless. And I'll define this more clearly in terms of the statistics. So if it's not a few nodes, we're done for anyway. So let's go for it. But it could be that there is a separate set of strings in an orthogonal circuit which I can fool around and the animal is actually doing it by something completely different. So I could have a separate set of strings I could sort of do, which are just hanging around there just because eventually evolution knew that I would come along or something. But it's, it's hard to imagine. I mean, so if you take, I mean, so naively you would say if I can control it and make it do it so beautifully, it must be the ones that are involved. And so the next step of your question would be, suppose I can take control of this animal with these few neurons and make it do what I want. Then I know that if in these neurons I could measure neural activity precisely where the animal is getting an input and moving, do the dynamic correspond to whatever I was doing naturally, in which case at least I can correlate the two. So in particular, like for that nematode, yeah. uh, if you remove those three neurons and they put in actual food... It should not be able to do it. That would be a stronger argument. A less strong argument would be if I could just see, if I could just look at the dynamics of those three and at least they correlate. So that would be the weaker one. The stronger is what you're saying. Get rid of them and show that you can't do it. In C. elegans it is. For stem cells, it's not. So, yeah. But you still want to do it. And I don't know if mapping really helps. If you look at the C. elegans neural network mapping, you would never have guessed the answers we guessed. So the mapping to first order is useless for this particular question. But once we know which buttons to push, then the mapping is profoundly useful because then I know what that button is doing downstream. Okay. So we've been trying to do this in two ways. One is to measure everything like people are doing. And I'll tell you what measure everything means. 
and then do some profound data analysis to see if we can figure out which buttons to push. And as I said, that's a hard problem, don't know how to do it. I'll tell you vaguely what progress we've made, but in terms of, I don't know if theory is the right word, but in terms of computational problems, this is, a, I think, a profoundly difficult and important problem as people keep saying they're measuring everything and we're all data dense. The other one is to not bother measuring anything and do some perturbations intelligently to find the key nodes. Right? And I'll tell you about both these approaches, the first one in terms of development, the second one in terms of C elegance, and the approaches are interchangeable. Right? But these are just first attempts, and again, much of this has been published this year or something, so. Okay, declaration of religious belief. Only a few nodes are important for control. Right? I have no evidence for it, no proof for it, except for, as I said, beautiful biology, and again, as I start learning biology, I find it spectacularly beautiful. It's just that how it was taught to me when I was in 10th grade was depressing. Uh, so the point is that that's a belief. And as I said, it's a very pragmatic belief because I don't know how to do anything if it were not the answer anyway, so then I would just give up. So as I said, it's a hard problem. You could call it an exponentially hard problem maybe. I don't know if it's exponentially hard or not yet. But if you're looking for three things out of a thousand, it scales exponentially. So, uh, and no idea how to solve this problem. Okay. And as I said, even without taking control, if I could, in the physicist's language, get an order parameter, meaning if I could read the mind of the animal precisely or read the mind of the cell precisely and ask, is it thinking of turning left or right? I could make profound advances anyway, even if I couldn't take control. So what I'm saying is, forget about nodes that can control, even nodes that, whose dynamics correlate with the decision, if I could find a few nodes, it would be very impactful in terms of understanding the system. So the bar is even lower than trying to take control. Which one? What is uh, C elegance? When it is, for example, uh, moving towards four. Yeah, no, we can do, all, I'll show you microscopy we've built over the last six years. We can do really, with the C elegance thing, you tell me what experiment to do, we can do it. Any experiment you can think of, we can do. That's how good we are technically, in terms of where we've gotten. The point is what experiments to do, and that's the hard, which is a nice place to be, I guess. Um, so, I, so in this mess, I want to take control of a few neurons. So let's go to approach one, which is I'm going to measure everything. And from these measurements, I'm going to figure out which neurons are important somehow. And this, I guess, goes to the topic of the workshop that's currently running. I would just argue that that's impossible to do or very hard to do, right? So let's just do the brute force approach. We measure everything. And then from these measurements, try to analyze the data and try to find which places. So it's just a hard problem, and I'll tell you why it's hard, even in a very naive sense uh, as an experimentalist, right? Okay, so let's do the following as a thought experiment. I just measure the activity of every neuron with very high precision, right? I measure its complete connectome. I measure all the neurotransmitters, anything I want. And then I'll do unbiased statistical analysis to somehow find which buttons to push. So that's the approach, that's one. So let's say there are about a thousand neurons that I can measure from, just to get some numbers in, right? And let's say I can measure about 10 things per neuron, spiking rate, spiking delay, whatever, 10 variables, right? So totally, from one biological sample, I'm measuring 10 to the four variables. Right? So it's 10 to the four variables per biological sample. So just remember this number. So every biological sample, I'm gonna measure 10,000 variables, and then I'll do replicates of it. Similarly, so I'm not talking about any practical matters. I'm just saying theoretically, I don't care what the size is. I have infinite resolution, I'll just measure everything accurately. I'm just measuring 10,000 variables per sample. That's the only point. I'm not even saying how I'm doing it. Or exp I'm, I'm just telling you, let's just assume that we can do it. 
and then see even in principle what the challenges are in making inferences, even if I could do it perfectly. If I do it perfectly and I still can't make the inferences, then I would not bother doing it perfectly, maybe is the argument. Take you measuring the time series of neurons. Time series of neurons, let's say, 10 the, of 10 to the 3 neurons. And I characterize these time series and some other variables, let's say 10 variables in neurons, so I measure 10,000 variables per brain. That's the only point I'm making here, okay? So similarly, I can do the same thing with single cells, and this is even more tangible during development, and we've actually done these experiments. This is cartoon of human brain developing, right? We've actually taken human fetal tissue during development. You can dissociate the tissue and gather single cells. So as the animal is developing and these pluripotent cells are making lineage decisions, you can catch the system as it goes, dissociate the cells, and get static snapshots of where the cells are. So how do you do this? You just catch system at time t1, t2, t3, as many time points as you want. And state of the art is about 1,000 cells per time point. So let's say we collect 1,000 cells at each time point. So every biological sample, I'm getting 1,000 cells. You send it through RNA sequencing. So what does that mean? You crush the single cell measure the level of every RNA species you can measure that the experiment allows you to measure given its resolution. And roughly in many experiments, or in, in our hands anyway, we can measure 10,000 distinct transcripts per single cell. So again, cells have genes, genes make RNA, RNA make proteins, these proteins are the ones that are making the decisions whether to become A or B. We can catch the state of the cell, measure the RNA, and measure the levels of 10,000 different RNA molecules per cell. Right? 10,000 per cell. Per cell. So again, 10 to the 4, that's why I said 10 to the 3 neurons, 10 to the 4 variables per measurement. So every measurement, I have 10 to the 4 variables. Right? So I take this data, every data point is 10 to the 4 dimensional. So in the case of gene expression, I have gene expression, gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, gene 10,000. So I have some 10,000 dimensional space. Every data point in this space is one point here. So this point would be one cell, right? So in the case of neural activity, every axis would be the activity time series of one neuron. So I have 10 to the 4 neurons or something. So again, some space like this, right? So important number to remember is about 10 to the 4 variables per cell. In the case of genes, I'm not very sure what, the, what is the... X-axis? Yeah. yeah. So gene 1 makes RNA of type 1, which is going to make species uh, protein 1. I crush the cell. Inside that cell, I know how much of RNA 1 is there. So the x-axis is just the concentration or the number of RNA molecules I caught from that cell for RNA 1. The y-axis is RNA molecules for RNA 2. So these are just numbers of RNA molecules. Okay. Uh, and these different RNA molecules do different things. You have functionally, you don't know exactly what they're doing and what numbers are actually relevant, which I'll come back to. But it's some number. I can measure it and I can plot data here, right? The problem is that there are serious challenges in analyzing such data. I'll just sketch cartoons of what the challenges are. And these, I think, are extremely important problems to solve. So let me just go through two challenges such data analysis techniques have. So if I look at the dimensionality of the space, right? I said I have 10 to the 4 variables. So dimensions of the space is 10 to the 4. Number of data points, let's say 1,000 cells, 1,000 neurons, number of data, sorry, 1,000 neurons, 1,000 samples, right? So this is number of samples, 1,000 brains, 1,000 cells. I have 10 to the 3 samples. That's pretty optimistic, but let's say 10 to the 3. Density of data in this space is 10 to the 3 divided by exponential of 10 to the 4, which is 0. So essentially, there is no way in hell you can populate this space with enough data to do any conventional statistics. So the space is mostly empty. And the uh, emptiness goes exponentially with the number of dimensions, clearly. So that's the same problem with personalized medicine, right? The more things you measure about me, the lonelier I get. And I get lonely very, very fast. So I'm very special, very fast, just by measure a few things about me. So the point is doing statistics to find a sample group that is sort of representative of me is exceptionally hard if I don't know what variables are important. That's the same problem that plagues all these problems. So first problem, data density is zero, uh, right? So the solution to this problem can never be gathering enough more data, 
right? I mean, you would have to get lots of the samples here to fill up the space sufficiently to do any statistics. The only way you can increase data density to do any kind of statistics is dimensionality reduction. So you have to somehow throw out dimensions, okay? So now, remember our religious belief that a few variables matter. So I'll tell you why dimensionality reduction is a problem if a few variables matter. So I said this already, you have to increase data density to do any kind of statistics. Only way to reduce, increase data density is reduce dimensions. So give you a simple example, right? To say why finding, doing dimensionality reduction is hard. So as I said, only a few variables matter, right? So let's say in this sort of tree, this was one cell type, this was another cell type. And I've measured two variables and I've plotted my data, right? You can certainly see that this data is bimodally distributed along the x-axis and unimodally distributed on the y-axis. So the signature of bimodality exists in only one of the two dimensions, okay? So here I have, again, cell type one, cell type two, and the signature of these two modes or these two distinct cell types exists only in one dimension. So let's say, just for notation's sake, for what's coming up, this entire space is 10,000 dimensional, of which two clusters are separated by some subspace, which is some Vij of some dimension ds, which is much smaller than d. Right? So I'm seeing some multimodal structure in a subspace. And remember, in the real problem, I don't know what the cell types are, I don't know what the decisions are, but if I saw some structure like this, maybe I could say, huh, if I could increase the genes that go along this way, I'll be able to push the cell type from here to there. That's why this multimodal structure is important because maybe those are the variables I can put de push decisions with. So I want to find these variables, right? So let's say I have some structure like this, where the multimodal signature is in a low dimensional subspace compared to the dimension of the full space. So let's say dimension of the full space is D. The dimension of the subspace that separates these two clusters is DS. So if you do PCA, any kind of analysis, uh, correlations, typical, I mean, what it depends on is the distance between points in this space, right? So if you take two points and you measure the distance in D, there is some distance DD. If you measure the distance in DS, the distance is D little s where ds is the actual distance I want in the subspace that I want, the correlation between dd and ds goes like ds over d. So if I look at correlations of the data in the full space without knowing what the relevant subspace is, I get my correlations all wrong. I get my Euclidean distances wrong. I get PCA wrong. Everything goes wrong. So if only a few variables matter, regular dimensionality reduction methods are in trouble because I need to be doing the analysis in a particular subspace, right? So again, conventional methods, even to reduce dimensions, forget about doing inferences of what buttons are important, go wrong, okay? And they're sort of trivial. So then the problem is if you're doing, collecting all the single cell data or doing neural recordings and trying to analyze them by doing correlations and PCA and only a few things matter, your analysis is wrong at the outset, and then you're in trouble trying to find what to press. Uh, I don't know if this is too much, but maybe I'll skip through some of this. This is all sort of stuff I was doing last night, but. If you're trying to also build clusters, why do you want to build clusters? I get the single cell data. I want to find cell types. What do I want to do to buy, get cell types? I want to make clusters of cells, saying these cells are more similar than those cells, right? So if the number of data points is n, the characteristic length scale in the full space is n raised to one over d. The characteristic volume that, you, that this length scale corresponds to in the subspace I'm interested in is this quantity here, right? So take this thing, raise it to ds, you get that. And you see if there is some characteristic length scale in the subspace, the clusters I'm building have very high entropy. So even if I think I'm clustering locally in the full space, I'm actually mixing in different cell types and again my analysis goes wrong. It's exactly the same reason why the correlations went wrong. So if you look at the entropy of the clusters you make, sorry, I don't know how to move slides. Right? 
if you try to calculate the entropy of the clusters that you make in the full space, you can't identify cell types either. So it's very hard to find the subspaces in which you see multimodal structure. So the problem is in many of these questions, if you think that a few buttons are important for control and you want to find these few buttons, even doing naive dimensionality reduction using the full data set has problems. So here is a simple illustration of this. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clusters. I just ran it and did some nonlinear embedding. If I decrease the space in which the clusters are separated, like the relevant low dimensional subspace that has structure, you see immediately clustering goes wrong, correlations vanish. It's exactly for the reasons I told you. Everything vanishes at ds over d. So doing any kind of clustering or correlation analysis is a problem. And here ds over d is 0.05, or let's say even 0.1. If 1,000 out of 10,000 genes matter for your analysis, you're already in trouble. And we're looking at about three or four genes mattering, maybe, or five genes mattering. So essentially, you're always in the regime when you're analyzing these data sets, if you believe that a small number of buttons exist, that your analysis is wrong at the outset through any naive dimensionality reduction. And this is pretty much the state of the art of this analysis here. Uh, actually, this is one step more than the state of the art. Yeah. Um, you seem to be treating gene activity data at different points on the other hand, there might be something that you know from the biology which tells you that some signals are more significant than others. Absolutely. If you knew any, so again, what this tells you is that, so that's a good question. So what it tells you is that first, dimensionality reduction is essential. There is a problem with dimensionality reduction, but if you use prior information to do dimensionality reduction, you're perfectly fine. Any which way you can do it correctly is great. It's just that the naive ways of doing it are not. So I would, if you knew what the answers are, I would do it. So what I mean by biology is there may be some genes which light up I mean, some, it doesn't quite work that way if there are a small group of genes that are involved. You never see such clean signature. If there's only one factor involved, I agree. But if it's a small group of factors involved in any particular decision, you do not, you cannot pull it out of the noise. And the other problem is that in the case where the literature doesn't exist, you can't do it either because, like we're looking at brain development, we actually want to find genes that drive differentiation towards particular locations in the brain. We no, have no prior information when it comes to human brain development. We somehow from this data have to pull it out, you see? And what you said was that if I knew that the cell was going this way or that, I could then pull it out, yes? Here is a problem. I just, so maybe I have to step back. What I did was break up the embryo, get single cells. From those single cells, I'm trying to define this way or that, even before trying to define which genes are correlated with going this way or that. All I have is single cell data. To define this way or that, I have to group the cells and say, this is this way, that is that way. I'm just telling you, even grouping the cells is a problem. If I go group the cells and say, this is this cell type, that is that cell type, then I can see which genes are correlated with these decisions, and then I'm one step ahead of the game. But grouping is a problem. Okay, and just naive geometry, that's all. I mean, it's just stupid arguments. But the point is that dimensionality reduction is a problem. I'll ask another naive question, which is, uh, why does the, for example, something like the principal complement analysis not allow you to the relevant dimensions? It doesn't, because principal component analysis, what you're doing, is getting the correlation matrix and getting the eigenvalue of the correlation matrix. The way you calculate the correlation matrix is to take the expression of all the genes in one cell, all the genes in the other cell, and look at the correlations between them, yes? But I'm just telling you that the correlations you get from looking at all genes versus only the correct subset of the genes are different. And your signal is completely drowned out by all the genes that don't matter. If you think that the signal is only in one small subspace, precisely, for here, for this reason. 
if only a small set of G, you take this data and do PCA, you will, there is no way in hell you're seeing two clusters. Just, just, just this data, precisely as drawn. One's clean direction, two noisy directions, cook up such data and try to do PCA, you will see that these blue and green clusters just merge with each other and you won't be able to tell them apart. This is somewhat shocking, isn't it? Again, simple MATLAB exercise. How do you change the state of a single, these are all experiments, I mean, so again, I'm just trying to see how I make different parts of the human brain. I don't know what that, I mean, so it, it's, if I had more knowledge about the system and I knew where the cell was going, so I'm just saying that we're far back from all the questions you're asking, even the starting point is difficult. And these are, I think, important questions to deal with. So one limit is when the number of signal dimensions is small, right, where, Data structure is multimodal in a small subspace, but in the rest of the space, it's all unimodal. I want to find the directions in which it's bimodal. There is also a separate limit, which is hard. So if I consider M clusters instead of just two clusters that I was showing you, okay? So I have M clusters, so I have M cell types in this big space. These M clusters live, I can see the definition of them in some low dimensional space, but not when I look at all the genes. So as I said, let Vij be the subspace which separates cluster i and j. Right? In our case, there was that one dimension that was separating the two clusters. So for every pair of clusters, I can cook up a Vij. So every pair has a subspace that distinguishes them. So I'll get m choose two such pairs of Vij. Okay? The hard limit in this case is when the intersection between any two pairs is null. So essentially, just that cartoon, you just feel like if I just looked at the marginal distribution in one direction, I'll get the answer. But in this case, no marginal distribution will tell you what the structure of the data is either. And I'll tell you, I'll show you what the cartoon of the data looks like. It's just a movie I made up to explain. Again, please interrupt me. As I said, I haven't. Somebody want to ask a simpler question. That is, uh, I don't want to control the tone behavior or the tone But I'm telling you, even that is, diff I'm just telling you, clustering is difficult. For saying whether it's this or that, I have to cluster. I'm saying this or not. I'm saying this or not. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it a point? No, 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 but, but again, I... I was not going to say that. No, but I'm looking, at, I'm not looking at the behavior of the, I'm look, okay. So let's look at single cell data. I just want to say, is it this cell type or not that cell type? Is it a neuron or not a neuron? Oh, neuron or not a neuron, the biologists in the audience will say, I know marker, SOX2, SOX1, PAC6, I can stain it, I know it's a neuron. But let's say whether it's an outer radial glial cell, which I'm gonna show you, is it an outer radial glial cell that's unique to humans or not? No way, because you don't even know what the markers are. Even when you try to cluster the data, if all your outer radial glial cells don't bunch up together, if they bunch up together, then I can say what is common in them which is not in everybody else. But if I don't even know how to cluster properly, then I'm in trouble <coughs> because I can't find the marker. You see, so that's, so the, forget about buttons and everything else, but we're dealing with things that are much more trivial in some sense. But again, the point is that there are lots of bioinformatics people doing lots of this stuff and some statisticians for sure, but I think it will be very, very useful to have physicists think about these problems because these are hard problems. People are not looking even at toy problems to solve them. And I think these need to be solved. And we've made some sorry attempts at it and we can get away with things as an experimentalist just to find what I want, but I think these are hard problems. So, so what I'm saying is that every pair of clusters is separated in a low dimensional space, but the intersection between these low dimensional spaces is null. What does that mean? Rajesh and I distinguish each, uh, are differentiated by one feature. But when I compare G2 and me, that one feature is not the feature that distinguishes us, it's something else. And with you, it's some other feature. So every pair has a subspace which separates them, but none of those subspaces are common. So if I just look at this data, I've just colored it by the clusters that I already know, which in the real problem I don't, and look at the marginal distribution along any of the dimensions, it looks like this. There is no structure at all, right? Even in this subspace, forget about all the other spaces in which it's unimodal. This is just in this DS dimensional subspace. 
So this is what the data looks like, just the green and the blue. You see that they're separated properly. But if I look at all the other clusters, the directions that separate the green and the blue are unimodal. So when I look at the marginal distribution, it looks like there are no clusters here, no structure here, in which case I can't tell you whether there is an outer radial glial cell or not. So if I knew the clusters along this marginal direction, I can get the two cell types to separate. Right? So two hard limits. One is when the informative subspace is small in dimension compared to the full space and clusters are only pairwise separable. If you can solve this problem, then you can solve lots of other problems. And the state of the art currently is from Tip Shirani at Stanford, where they have two clusters, the first cartoon I showed you, that's the state of the art, where you have to know how many clusters are there in the problem. Remember, as a start, in, with the brain development, you don't know how many cell types there even are. So in that problem, you have to know how many cell types there are to start with. If you knew the answer, then you can iteratively change the clusters and the dimensions and try to narrow down to the right subspace where you see the structure. So that's state of the art. Okay. And it's, again, hard problem. So as I said, if we can solve this problem, we can solve easier problems. And this particular problem we can now solve in one limit, where the clusters are such that the lab axis corresponds to the subspaces. So it's not a rotated problem, but it's a problem where G2 and I are separated by one transcription factor. Rajesh and I are separated by another transcription factor. In lab coordinates, I'm measuring transcription factors anyway. So all the clusters are oriented with my lab axis. In that case, we can solve the problem. If the clusters are oriented in some random way, which are not oriented along the lab axis, which should be the case for neuroscience, where there will be groups of neurons and you have to rotate your space, then we don't know how to solve the problem yet. Okay. So, um, and I'll jump through some of the details, but what we do is calculate the weights of dimensions and say, is it a good dimension or bad dimension? And we can calculate weights of good dimensions, calculate weights of bad dimensions, since we know the answer for the toy problem, and find ratios of these. And the way we do that is to somehow calculate the joint probability distribution of the weights of the different dimensions, right? So I have 10,000 dimensions. I can calculate the weights of every one of the dimensions. I can also calculate the cluster identity. If I could get a joint probability distribution of these two instead of defining anything and integrate over cluster identities, then I can get the probability distribution for G. And once I can get the probability distribution for G, I can get all the Gs that are high confidence, good dimensions, and that we can do. And the way you cluster, integrate over clusters is to have an ensemble of clustering configurations, use all possible clustering configurations and integrate this variable out. And then we've been able to calculate it. But again, for the simple problem, I'll skip through the details. But it turns out that if we look at the expectation value of GS to GN, this is the expectation value of the weights of the good dimensions to bad dimensions. With what we can do, it goes like D over square root of DS which means that it's the opposite limit where people have trouble with. Usually when ds over d becomes small, all the other methods fail. We are in a regime where when d over square root of ds becomes large, we can actually solve the problem. So this is the opposite limit of what people can do in the literature for this simple problem where the clusters are properly aligned. And then we can take this and look at the same single cell data. This is single cell data correlations using all genes. This is just these rows are, each row is a cell here, each column is a gene. These gene names I've minimized just to save you the trouble of reading them. And this is for human brain development, and you start seeing structure. This is the subspace in which you can see structure, you can see clusters. Now I can say where are the cells, which way is it going, because I can start telling you, oh, those cells are outer radial glial cells. Okay, so just by doing this dimensionality reduction in a slightly smarter way, trying to see where there is multimodal structure. And basically what you're saying is that if the data has multimodal structure in some subspace, can I find that subspace and then go ahead? And we've used this for early human brain development. So we took human brains, 16 post-conception weeks, 15 post-conception weeks, dissociated them with single cell sequencing, particularly to ask if there are cell types that are unique to human developing humans. And we discovered cell types in humans that are not present in any of the lower primates. These are dividing cell types. 
and we found a molecular marker precisely by trying to find the right subspace in which they define them. These happen to be the outer radial glial cells I mentioned before. There is a marker called HOPEX. All these cells express HOPEX. So just by HOPEX, we can tell you if it's that gene or not, or that cell type or not, okay? So we cut the brain in half, take one half, dissociate it, do single cell sequencing, do all the mumbo jumbo analysis to find markers, go back to the other half, immunostain for this gene that we found, and look for the cell types to see if our clustering was right, if our gene expression was right. So you go into a human brain, look at these cell types. We find cell types precisely with the shape all over the place. They all light up for HOPEX. So we can actually define cell types of a morphology. Yeah. I'll tell you what HOPEX is in a second. HOPEX expression is not seen in lower primates. It's only seen in humans in brain development. I mean, we found it. HOPEX has been implicated in mice in colon cancer. Okay? So HOPEX is a gene that causes cancer, presumably. It's expressed in the human brain during early development, not present in mouse. Okay? And now I'll tell you where these cell types are, which is where it gets interesting. Sorry, did you say not present in mouse brain? Not present in mouse developing cortex, to be precise. I don't know about anything else. Okay? I'll tell you where, where these cells are. This is a developing mouse brain. You don't need to worry about the cartoons, but here is where cells are born. <clears throat> they differentiate, go up, and make the brain. Okay? This dotted line is what I want you to pay attention to. These two dotted lines over the period of mouse development does not increase in size at all. If you look at where these HOPEX cells are, they are between these dotted lines here and there. This is the corresponding interval between those two dotted lines in humans. It expands enormously during development and then contracts back down. And it's thought that most of the progenitors here are responsible for the expanded gyrated cortex in the human brain. So we can actually find these cells expressing HOPEX, which presumably are important for proliferation, precisely in the region where the human brain expands during development. So we can go through all of this and get to um, I think I'm already very slow, uh, but I don't want to bore any of you, so you should just make me stop, because I sort of got ambitious, I think. But I can stop here, or I can tell you sort of a quick thing about how else we might try to find key buttons. And we've done some stuff on compressed sensing with C. elegans, which again is sort of published work. But the idea there is, can I quickly find the key neurons? And I'll just run through it very rapidly without any details, and if anybody wants to bug me after, right? Yeah? So the tools that you developed to find out the uh, maximum, just not specific to the gene expression? Uh, anything data? No, 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 but I'm assuming that the, so the clusters are separated along my lab axes then we can solve the problem. If the clusters are separated this way and that way, and not, so I'm assuming that my axes along the wall are important axes. Yeah, and that somehow I'm measuring the right axes in the lab, which works well for development because I know that transcription factors are important and I'm measuring transcription factors anyway. But if it's groups of neurons that are important, then I'm in trouble if the axes don't mean anything. So in the case of neuro, I don't know. So this rotated problem is hard and I think it's worth solving. Where? It looks like the simple problem when you look at it the right way, but just rotate that cube and look for the distribution of the data on the hypersphere. Okay, so that problem we don't know how to solve, right? So this is the expanding cortex. This is from our data. So you can just see enormous expansion in the human brain that does not happen in any of the lower primates. And the cell types we find are there, and they're expressing all these genes associated with cancer. And actually, we've been able to make this cell type with stem cells now. We actually make them, so, but I won't get into that. Well, very quickly, in 10 minutes, I'll just rush through things, just to give you a feel for what other ways might be there. But again, all of these are not answered questions. So one thing is you're doing dimensionality reduction anyway. You're taking all this data and throwing out dimensions. So why not measure less to start with? So why should you measure everything? Why not measure much less? But you don't know what to throw out, so you somehow have a chicken and egg problem where you have to throw out things that you don't want, but you don't know what you don't want until you measure it. So can we do this? And this is just following recipes given by Candace and Tao 
just profound papers from 15 years back. We just implemented it experimentally. Um, so here is a toy problem, right? And you've done this problem in school. I don't want to measure everything. I want to measure a few things and quickly find out what things are important. So if I have 64 variables, six measurements, can I find the value of the 64 variables? So I have six simultaneous equations with 64 variables. Can you tell me the value? You would say six equations, 64 variables, not possible. But if I told you the following problem, I have 64 coins, one of them is heavier than the rest, find me the heavy coin, you can do it in five measurements, which is log 64. So what Candace and Tao told us is that if you have a much harder problem, which no smart high school student can solve, I have 64 coins, some number of the coins are heavier or lighter, I don't know which ones, but the number of coins with a different weight are much smaller than 64, that's all I know. That problem you can solve too with log 64 measurements. Okay? And this is only for a linear set of equations. But for nonlinear stuff, there is no careful theorems yet. So what we have to do is make much fewer measurements, use something called an L1 norm to find the solution. Right? And again, I'll rush through this because I feel very guilty about having uh, way too much. I should have just stopped halfway, I'm sorry. I'll skip all this. But what we can do is equivalently take these C elegans, measure the weights of these neurons if you like. So let's say six C elegans has 64 neurons. These 64 neurons are like my 64 coins. What we have to do is measure the weights of these neurons to see what's important for a behavior. Just like you did with the high school problem with more complicated math. And so, the key thing to do is, the key assumption again is that a small number of neurons matter, which is how we found the neurons in the first place that I showed you in the movie way back, right? So I assume that a small number of neurons matter. It means that only a small number of neurons have a different weight than the majority. I want to find this small number of neurons rapidly, right? So I somehow have to take these neurons, weigh them, and find the heavy neurons, just like my coin problem, right? And what does weighing them mean? Weighing them is behavior. So what I can do is express uh, channel rhodopsin or archaeorhodopsin, which are light activator channels. I can shine light on the animal, look at the defect in behavior. When I shine light on the animal, only the neurons that have affected get messed up and the behavior gets messed up to some degree. Okay, so the behavior is my weight. You can do the monitoring too. You can try to monitor the activity of all the neurons during movement and from that try to infer. But I'm saying that instead of monitoring their activity, forget about monitoring, just perturb their activity. Yes. Can you monitor 300 neurons at the time But I'm saying the, the point is you can, you can, but the point is that if you monitor enough neurons with the time series, it's the same problem as the previous problem. Right. But if it is sparse coding, then only the rest of neurons will If it is, yeah, yeah. No, so you could do that. I'm just telling you that you can do it more easily without doing any kind of neural activity measurement just by perturbing neurons. Uh, so essentially what we do is express these light activator channels in these neurons under different promoters, okay? So if you look at the lines of C elegans, I'll skip this. This is one coin pile if you like. All these neurons are expressing a light activator channel so that when I shine light on it, the animal will not be able to activate those neurons. This is another coin pile, that's another coin pile, that's another coin pile, another one, another one, right? So each of these is a pile. I will take these coins and weigh them. How do I do that? I just activate with light, look at the defect in behavior. The level of defect in the behavior will be the weight of that pile. I have 100 neurons, but with compressed sensing, I can use far fewer piles of neurons than I thought necessary. And from that, try to infer the key neurons or the small number of neurons that matter. Again, just like the high school student finding the heavy coin quickly, okay? So you can actually do this, so you can get a measurement matrix, so every 
row here is a pile. Every column is a neuron identity. White means that the neuron is present. Black means that the neuron is absent. So each row is a pile. So you have 29 piles. So you have 29 equations. And so for each equation, what you do is take this animal, shine light on it, look at the defect in behavior. So your defect in behavior is as such. So here we put the animals down, shine light on them. This is one particular pile of neurons. You see some behavior. This is another pile of neurons. And you can just monitor their behavior. And you see that the behavior in every line is different. So every pile has some behavioral defects. And we can calibrate these behavioral defects, measure it. And the measurement of the defect is just like your weight of your coins. Right? So you have 29 equations, 114 variables. Your weight is the phenotype. And you want to solve 29, sorry, you want to solve for these 29 variables to see what's important. What's hidden under the rug is that this is not a linear equation, but we just treated it as such and said, okay, can we still infer what the key neurons are? And the short answer is that we can, just with compressed sensing, we can tell you precisely which neurons are important from this class of measurements very quickly. So if you have, we have transgenic lines with 29 lines, each with this set of neurons. So we have the piles already genetically determined in tubes. We can measure the weights of the coins and then pull out what is the important coins, and this is a sparsity parameter that I don't have the time to get into, but we can pull out these neurons very quickly. So rather than measuring everything, if you assume that a small number of things are important, measure in random combinations of things, or perturb rather than random combinations of things. And if you make the assumption that a small number of things are important, then you can use compressed sensing to say, okay, which are the heavy coins in the problem? And we can pull it out. Okay. So, huh? No, we just look at the distribution function of the behavior and we measure the kullback leibler distance and the distribution function between the mutant and the wild type. So, and we've tried multiple metrics for the defects, right? So effectively by looking at some small, much fewer, so if you're doing perturbations, typically you would have to perturb each of the 114 and in every combination and so on. Here you can just perturb random combinations of them and if you assume a small number matter, you can just pull them out immediately. So, and we can show that these are the right answers. One final thing, just in case it's useful for anybody, we can do very, very fast tracking and optogenetics with this animal. We can get images, image process, position all our mirrors to shine light where we want, and move all the hardware, all in about four milliseconds. And so, and this is completely freely moving animal. With, and we can track in X, Y, and Z with one micron precision without a cover slip for the people that care. So we can do very fast image processing, very fast tracking, and then perfect control with our mirrors to shine light on wherever we want to, which is how I did the experiment I did before. So I just want to show you things, but I don't need to. I can show it offline. But the point is that we can start doing experiments like this. We can find key neurons and then start controlling their dynamics. We can actually measure their neural activity once we have found the neurons and then reproduce the neural activity and start getting behavior. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can tell you which is speed because we know which phenotypes are measuring. So based on what you define as a weight of your coins, you just have different weights. One is for direction, one is for speed, one is for reversal. And so from the same matrix with the same experiments, I can tell you if I assume there are a small number of neurons that matter, I can tell you which are the important neurons. Then with this fancy microscope, we can measure the activity in these neurons to see if they correlate. And then we can go and produce the activity in those neurons to produce behavior. We haven't gotten that far yet. We've just been using naive kullback leibler like distances of distribution functions of the behavior, but not the, right? So I think, again, there are two naive ways, just to conclude, there are two ways, I think, forward if we want to really take control, and neither of these seem, I mean, they're not great, but we need to start thinking very carefully. One is measure high dimensional data. From these high dimensional data, Forget about doing causal inference and everything else. Even getting multimodality and clustering is a hard problem. 
because you don't know what subspace in which you should be measuring distances in. So if you're doing Pythagoras distances between points, you measured in the wrong space, you're in trouble. So trying to even discover the information in which data is, has some structure is a hard problem. We can solve it for a simple case, but there are harder cases in which we need to solve it. Once you find the subspace, then you have enough data in that subspace to start doing conventional statistics and presumably causal inference like things with joint probability distributions only in that subspace. Now you have enough data. We have never gotten to that step yet, but the hope is that if you can sort of produce dimensions, then you can do joint probability distributions and then causal inference. But we haven't gotten that far yet. The other is to not bother measuring everything, just perturb everything in random combinations. Assume that a few things are important. And once you assume that a few things are important, then use something like compressed sensing. Again, it's not clear that compressed sensing should work for this case because it's for linear, a linear problem. And nonlinear problem, there are no guarantees, no bounds, no nothing, right? So this is just sort of not remotely rigorous. But we need approaches like that, presumably, again, theoretically to ask. In the case of nonlinear problems, how do we get methods like compressed sensing to work? In which case, if I was looking at genetics, what I would do is not knock out one gene at a time if I think that some gene is important or a few genes are important. I would knock out random sets of genes, large numbers of them. And I'll knock out much fewer sets than the number of genes, and I'll still be able to figure out what the key sets are, which is what this says. And if we can do something like that, then we can at least identify what the key places are where I need to do more careful experiments. Currently, if you look at human brain development, and I want to make cell types that are associated with cell types in the human brain that are special to the brain. I don't know even if they exist. Forget about pressing the right buttons, but I mean, but that's where we are. And the amount of data that's being collected currently is enormous. Even in the last year, there's single cell data for every developing, I mean, it's just sort of insane. So we have lots of data, but the point is that it's high dimensional data and we somehow have to make sense of it. And then there are beautiful questions associated with evolution of develop, like, you know, the comparative developmental biology, which again, this should open doors to, but the data analysis is the problem. The experiments are not. I mean, any of you guys can pay a company and get this data if you want. Getting the data doesn't require expertise anymore to some degree, right? Dissociation is hard, but the rest of it is completely doable. I think what is lacking is some careful thought about how to really think about this data to make experimental predictions, not just data visualization. And that I think is an enormous, it would be an enormous help if any of you get into it. A quick question about the, you know, the, uh, the credit uh, looking, using AI as a, as a way to. Yeah. Good question. Uh, okay. wait, wait, wait. So let me cut you short right there. A very good question. People ask, right? I mean, it shouldn't work. I mean, at all. So, there are two kinds of problems. One is supervised learning. Supervised learning, you're the AI machine. I'm gonna show you images of cat, dog, cat, dog, and on the top I will write cat or dog, and I will train you. Then I will remove these cats and dog pictures and show you an unlabeled picture of one of the two animals, and you will call cat or dog. That's AI, that's supervised learning. Here, there is no labeled data set to train on. So this is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning, none of that works, right? If I already knew which my cluster is and I could give you some training data, oh, look, this is an outer radial glial cell, this is not an outer radial glial cell, then I can train a nonlinear classifier to separate the two. But I need labels. You, still have to give many, you need to give labels. Many data, data sets for the... You have to train the machine, that's a whole other problem. But the problem is that you need labels to train it. Sure. None of these problems have labels. You have to discover the labels and then, uh, so that's the problem. No, but those just tell you. I know, but I pick up I don't know how to think about that. I don't know, I don't know. But I think, yeah, but the main, po the important point to realize, supervised and unsupervised, and people use AI rather loosely, uh, but it's all supervised learning. I mean, you can have adversarial learning where you have one AI training the other and so on, but it's still effectively all supervised. Unsupervised learning problems are horribly hard. 
And here you have one saving grace, which is that the data should be multimodal. So all you're looking for is multimodal signatures, variances, and moments don't matter. All you care is multimodality when it comes to at least discrete decisions of turning left and right. So how many For the neurons? Yeah. 29. 29. Yeah. 29, and I can tell you which sets of neurons do which behavior. So, sorry. So number of experiments should go like S log N, where N is a number of neurons, or N is a number of objects. S is your sparsity. What do you expect the size of the answer to be? Right? So S you don't know, except that it's much less than N. But in your case, S was 3 and N was something. S I didn't know. Yeah, but it turned, it out, turned out to be 3, three, three, three 4, or something. Three, yeah. Four, and N was 114. So 114. Yeah. So yeah. But finally, you still have to do the experiment to show that it works. But yeah, but that's the assumption. And the point is that such experiments we can do on three or four neurons, doing it on uh, 50 neurons is impossible. But I think it's the same thing with molecular like development too. Perturbing 50 genes at the same time is exceptionally difficult. Couple of questions. One is, have you thought of a genetics approach to try and reduce the dimensionality of the space you need to search in? You think? No, none of these 114 neurons have to a specific. I know this well because we. Maybe in a, okay. none of the interneurons, mostly with a few exceptions, most of the interneurons do not have specific promoters. My question still holds, which is, if you take the cell type specific promoters you know and selectively knock out single sure. cell types, and then screen for behavior. Okay, so if it is one neuron, it will, but it will take you 114 measurements instead of 29 measurements. If there are 114 cell types, you have to knock each of them out one at a time, make 114 lines. Here, it's 29 lines, so it's much less work to start with. And you do not have to make the assumption that only one matters. It can be two matters, three matters, you will still pull it out. It's just a much, much less work. It's exponentially less work. Yeah, you just break it up into. Yeah, so in, yeah, good point. So in the 64 coin problem, if I said one coin is heavy, of course you can measure one coin at a time and find the heavy coin. But that'll take you 64 measurements instead of six measurements. You could. You could, which is effectively this, which is effectively this. I'm just doing it with optogenetics instead of permanent knockout because I can also control the dynamics. Precisely. Uh, my other question was, so the neurons that you uh, now managed to identify, are they different from those that were already suspected to be part of the chemosensory motor response pathway? Some of them are. <clears throat> and also the point is that, so there are two answers to the question. Some of them are, but more importantly, there's a difference between necessary and sufficient. Here I'm just telling you what is sufficient, not what's necessary. And that is a different question. So that's why I meant by video game and control, I'm going for sufficiency and not for necessity. You had a question, Ali? No. If you assay was looking at yeah. looking at the phenotype, which yeah. was, was, was sensory input translating into motion. Right. So somehow you No, but the point is that if you can find a small set, then you have to show that it's necessary. No, so there is this connection, right? So I don't know what it, so finally, I don't know what it means to control. I don't know if making it into a video game is the right way to do it. I don't know if there is a control circuit inside. If there is, I don't know how to find it from these big data sets. But it seems like one needs some kind of coherent framework to tie all of this together and it doesn't exist. And it would be nice to have such a coherent framework even for a toy problem that you build by hand on a computer. You can make a circuit on a computer, make it do stuff. If you can come up with a coherent framework to actually define necessary conditions on that circuit, you're already, I think, I think it's a fun problem and we don't know how to do it. And I think it's a hard problem. I mean, I think that's why people in this room should be doing it since we don't know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, 
so instead in uh, statisticians have an about the day to day Okay. So I told you in terms of the clustering, there is this no, no. So no, no. There is nothing in the literature, and yeah. So the I mean, so two questions here, right? I think one is more a philosophical thing, and what precisely has been done here? Here I can tell you precisely what's been done is this problem, where I have x and I have two clusters like this, and I have y. This is some dimension d, and this is some dn, this is some dimension ds. In this case, if you give me this data and tell me that there are two clusters, even if the clusters are not oriented along a particular axis, so they can be like this. And I don't know the axis either. That has been solved if you tell me the number of clusters. So you have to know that there are two. And then the answer will converge and tell you that this is the axis that's important. But that's where things are in terms of literature here. But more broadly, I think none of this clustering or anything matters unless you can predict an experiment at the end of the day. So what's missing with the statisticians is sort of a much closer collaboration with the experimentalists to make a prediction. That's missing. So then it's, I mean, yeah, there is this, but I think when you're sitting on the experimental data and you want to do it, it's a different problem altogether. Um, and then you have to come, I mean, so maybe they never have to consider this problem where you have this funky structure where the interse intersection between the subspaces is null and so on. In development, you see it all the time. So then you have to solve the problem. But it's not clear that that's an important problem, right? I don't know if it is. It sounds like a mathematically natural question. It seems like a limit, yeah. but you would not have thought of that limit until you saw this data and said, oh shit, the same factors are being reused everywhere and I can't classify, I can classify by this factor here in development, but not there. Because there it's reused and all the cells have it, and so then everything becomes unimodal. So I think it's more exposure to data. And finally, it's about experiment. I mean, you have to predict the experiment and do the damn experiment. Right? So sort of, uh, Thank you.